Welcome to Whole Back Rack Podcast. My name is Jessica Hare. I operate Hare Hollow Farm and we breed boas, balls, and select colubrids. Hi, I'm Jenna King. I operate ASM Royal Tails and I breed high end ball pythons. We want to share our journey navigating herpetoculture and are dedicated to promoting biohazard safety for all species. And we would love you to answer the question what's in your whole back rack? Well, hello there. Uh, because I'm mentally unfit for duty, we forgot our Shane Kelly ad read in this episode of the podcast. So I'm doing it now, after the fact, making up for failings. This will be the goofy Shane Kelly ad read that um, I didn't want to do, but now I'm doing it. So here we are. Shane Kelly of Small Town Exotics is breeding high-end ball pythons, including the Kiki Project, which Jana is very deeply entrenched in as well. He likes busy, fun, dark clowns, and he's even playing with hognose snakes and leopard geckos. So check him out on YouTube, Morph Market, and Instagram for all of your Shane Kelly needs. Now on to the podcast episode, where we're interviewing a not Shane Kelly person. I struggled a little bit with this. I have to say, it's not safe for work before I say the F-bomb. <laughs> All right. Everybody, this is episode 37. What's your last 38? name, Maddox? Gray? Gray. 38. Gray? I didn't listen yep. to that. And we have today Max Gray from Outworld Reptiles. Hey, but you said 37 and it's 38. Fuck. Do you want to do it again? Nope. Leaving okay, it all cool. in. Cool. How are you doing today, Maddox? I am doing pretty good. Are you doing? traumatized to be on the worst podcast on <laughs> the internet i am really excited for this actually all right good thank you i appreciate it yay <laughs> <laughs> one of our 10 followers wants to be on our show i'm i'm excited by that <laughs> you volunteered somehow did you suffer like a concussion right before that or <laughs> It was because I got really excited because I was going, well, it might have been some of the latter, but mm-hmm. I was going through, like, the, like, backlog of all your guys' podcasts, and I had just listened to, like, the one where you guys were on the tangent of Magic the Gathering. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, these are reptile <laughs> people, and they're Magic the Gathering people. These are my people. <laughs> yeah, not we're a bunch of super nerds. Yeah. Don't tell anybody, of, okay? You can't let it get out. <laughs> keeping it to myself. There was also the tangent of erotica that occasionally comes up. <laughs> I'm like, wow, these really are this like I do. I have think found my possible. people. <laughs> yeah, I assume that all of these categories in my life are always going to be separate groups. Like I have my reptile folks, I have my magic gathering nerds, I have my like author group, half of which dabble in writing erotica, because that is how you make money as an independent author. Yes. And here we are. With all of you just smushing it all together. <laughs> that's, that's, yep. <laughs> all right, I have a question. First question. Favorite ship all time. Favorite ship? Yeah. Let me guess. Wait, wait. Let's guess. That'll be funny. Harry Draco. Favorite ship. Dang it. Uh-oh. Dang it. Gianna, favorite, sh- favorite ship? Relationship? Favorite pairing? Sla- slash or otherwise? Yeah, I'm like, I I'm not weird. I don't like ship a lot of characters. I mean, I ship myself with a lot of characters. Oh, well, you're a Mary Sue. Excellent. <laughs> I've written some I, Mary Sue. I'm not sure. I'm not scared to admit it. I mostly just watch all of like the drama that unfolds from the various things that get shipped. Like I read all like the Sarah J. Moss books, and there are like Reddit threads, all of her fantasy books, where people very aggressively ship some characters. <laughs> It is and funny. I just sort of like watch all that unfold. I'm like, so you don't, but you don't have a ship in your mind or like a head cannon so. that okay. exists. So like, I don't like. There are mostly like some canon relationships that I'm very defensive of. Like, I'm a huge fan of The Witcher, and so mm-hmm. to me, like Witcher and Yennefer like belong together. Mm-hmm. Like, I will not allow any other ships. So whenever people bring up Triss, I'm like, no. <laughs> That is not how this works. All Get right, so you're here. a canon defender. Your head canon. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I defend those relationships. Okay. This Other is good to know. Hungry. This has a lot to do with reptiles. 
by the way. Lots. <laughs> yes. Very, very important. But you know, sometimes people don't want to hear about reptiles for an hour straight. So it's okay <sighs> no, to it's talk so in a little. <laughs> so tell us how you got started in the hobby, the reptile hobby. I was always that weird kid who just loved reptiles. I grew up in Northern California. So I mean, like I would be going in the backyard and be like, look at these garter snakes and have just like handfuls of like breathing garter snakes or like, oh, this child again. So I was just like, I was catching critters in the backyard. And then I discovered the East Bay Vivarium when I was a kid, which is like a big reptile shop in Berkeley, California. And I just, I think my brother's girlfriend got me my first snake, which was a corn snake. So like corn snake was first. Then I had king snake. I think the first bow I got was a Brazilian bow. It's like as a kid, like I just kind of had a whole bunch of reptiles. And then in college, I got into breeding jungle carpet pythons with another friend of mine who kind of jointly had a little breeding colony. I started to get more into boas at that point, like boa constrictors. Um, and that's kind of like where I've gone since. I moved from California to New England over a decade ago. I gave her all of my jungle carpet pythons except for one. And I brought all my boas with me. Drove across the country in a little tiny Toyota Yaris. I was loaded up with my old dog, who was an Australian Shepherd mix, my cat, and then just the entire hatchback was snakes, two Chinese water dragons, a uh, leopard gecko. Like, it was ridiculous. And I camped across the way. Oh, so, man. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was a good, good times. Uh, everybody made it. Some of them might have been grumpy, but they all made the trek across the country. Pretty much breeding was ever since. So that was like 10 events. years ago or so? Yeah, like 13 years. Mm. I've been in New York too long. Yeah, it's like 13 years. You started to breed boas intensely. When did you, do you want to describe your sort of run-in with discovering arena virus and uh, sorting yeah. out that part of your... I know. Yeah, definitely. I think I found it the way that everyone finds out about it. Things start to go bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Yeah. In 2020, seems like forever ago, but it was only two years ago, like a lot of folks, I lost my job, which sucked, and I was working on a career shift. So I was doing all of that, and like, I was just depressed because, you know, it was 2020. I was like, you know what? I haven't got a new snake in forever. A new snake with these very specific genetics. Looked everywhere, couldn't find it, except for from one wholesaler. And I, like... I had heard things about this particular wholesaler, but like I wasn't super engaged in the reptile community, so I didn't know any of the specifics. And I was like, how bad can it be? I'll, I'll quarantine the thing for three months. Hold my It'll beer. Be how bad can it It'll be? It'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. So got this mic. It was super pretty. Right away, something was wrong. It looked healthy. It would not eat. And it wasn't like I've had some bows I've gotten from some breeders like, where they fed live and they just picky about switching over to frozen thawed, which most boas aren't, but I was like, all right, maybe you're the weird one. Fried live, it had zero interest. It never hissed, never bit. I couldn't like quite tell if it had problems with like its muscles. It just had zero interest in eating. I was like, this is weird. Let it get settled after two months, it still wouldn't eat. Getting a vet appointment at that time was like Almost impossible in the mm -hmm. Boston sell area. Sell your firstborn child just to get a vet appointment. Yeah, and like, not to mention, like, a lot of vets don't see reptiles. Like, I was finally able to get, like, one place that was, like, two hours away. Like, we'll take a look. I took it there. They did some, like, x-rays on it. Because at this point, I was like, is it blocked somewhere? Like, is there some type of physical thing going on that it can't eat? We couldn't find anything. And my research at that point, that was when I first learned about IBD. I think like a lot of folks, I had associated IBD with like stargazing and like the really dramatic, you know, boas flipping around. And then I learned like, oh, there are a whole bunch of other symptoms associated with it. And a lot of the boas and pythons that get it probably die before they ever get to the stargazing dramatic flipping stage. I was like, oh, and like one of the symptoms was not eating and like regurgitation issues and things like that. So I did an arena test through, I did the whole BOA panel. Everything came back negative. I was still early enough on my journey where I did not know that it is possible for them to test negative even if they have it. The viral load isn't high enough. And at this time, the snake was only five months old, six months old. 
So still a baby. And I had to assist feed it for like six months. It just would never eat. But it would eat if I assist feed it and kind of let it alone, then it would finish. So this went on and I was just like, ah, I've never encountered this problem with bones before. I kept it quarantine. It eventually did start to eat on its own. Never struck, it never constricted. If I left the, you know, warmed up like hopper, small mouse in his cage, it would eat. So it started to grow, it started to gain weight. It's like, well, like, I don't know, maybe this was just like a weird failure to thrive yeah. thing, and it's turned around. So after six months, it seemed like it was fine. It was eating, put in a rack with the rest of my snakes. No, <laughs> you had done like everything, like you did the test and you had given it the right amount of time. Like, it wasn't yeah. like it was a, a failure to do something from the beginning. You did all the steps. Oh, uh, that yeah. sucks. Yeah, and looking back, I'm like, no. Oh. So I went in the rack with a bunch of my other snakes, including in that rack, the bottom of it was my ball python, who I'd had for like 15 years. Just a normal ball python who was like a rescue. I thought that I had pretty good biosecurity practices in place. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just like in my head, I was like, all my snakes are healthy, so this is fine. I'm doing um, good. That's how I always yeah. feel. And then Jessica talks to me, and I'm like, oh, I need Ooh. to do better again. <laughs> yeah. A few months went by. I want to say it was like three or four months. Uh, my ball python developed an arm. It's like, all right, weird, but it was during like it was towards the end of winter time here, and like humidity drops like crazy in the basement. So it's like, all right, maybe like the humidity was too low. She's getting older. Weird. Got her a vet appointment, got her some antibiotics, started treating her. Within a few weeks, she had like a weird growth that developed, like underneath her, call her throat necessarily. She wasn't responding to the antibiotics. So I reached out to the vet again, got her appointment to bring her in, and she died before that. Appointment. And like, I had like a whole bunch of like personal stuff going on in my life at this point. Um, oh, it's always so, right in the middle when know, everything else is like, blowing up. Yeah, like the timing of it was just the worst. And then a few of my boas in that rock Um And I was like, I've owned snakes a long time. I've had, I've had maybe two or three boas get RIs. And everything, I was like, this is weird. So like, I isolated all of them, got them all on like antibiotics. And then this is where like, you know, the thoughts of Marina came back again with and some of them regurgitating. It's like, oh God. So I tested everyone in my collection and all the ones that were sick were positive for me. And a few that were asymptomatic were also positive. And so then it became this like month plus hell of me being like, do I think they're going to come around? Because like, I'm, I'm like, I personally am very attached to my snakes. I am not a big breeder. I have 45 what I call permanent residents in my collection. And like everyone has names. I know all their personalities, and unfortunately, yeah, family like, members yeah like i like so like it was really like emotionally traumatizing for me to be like do i need to put them down and the ones that had ris were just even if they did recover from it they would get another ri again like after like six weeks like i just kept coming back and they started a couple of them started to lose weight which for bo is to lose weight like if uh, like i have males That's not like the crazy eat thing for six for months bow, and they'll yeah, like, like, yeah, I haven't eaten for six months, I still gained weight. And I'm like, oh. So, like, when they started losing weight in a matter of months, I was like, what the hell? So, yeah, I made the decision to put every, all the ones that were showing any types of symptoms that were positive or had been euthanized. The whole process sucked because I, like, had to bring them to the vet because I'm not comfortable, like, pulling mm -hmm. my boas and just, like, the emotional trauma of it. It's like, Nope, right. I'm just going to give somebody money to do this. Um, because it's already going to really hurt. Yeah, I was like, I can't. It's already going to suck so bad, yeah. That whole time period, I feel like it was like a year. Like, like, and I it's COVID. Yeah, it's <laughs> COVID. I was like oh job gosh. searching and interviewing like crazy. So I was like going on these interviews, you know, like 15 minutes before I had been bawling my eyes out. So I was like making the decision to, you know, put some mm. of my snakes down. And then getting on these interviews and be like, hi, give me a job, please. <laughs> Promise so, yeah, it's just 2020. I'm not normally like this. <laughs> yeah. Ignore my super red puffy eyes. Everything's fine. So yeah, sad. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't call my favorites. I couldn't do it. I had to give it to like my cousins because they were yeah. like, the most important things ever. And they had to give. 
Yeah, it it sucked. So yeah, after that, I just went on a like testing spree, like of testing everything in my collection multiple times. Um, I do still have a few of the positives left that I've kind of isolated in their own area. Our basement's pretty big, so they're still in the same room, but they're like their racks are Besides. separate. Yeah. yeah. Seeing how, like, and this was, like, discovered the Discord, we seem pretty confident that it is not spread through the air. Yeah, pretty confident. Yeah. As confident so, as we need to be, I think. Yeah. yeah. As confident as we need to be to be comfortable that it's not doing that, right. for now, unless any information comes out. Yeah. We had a big we had a big discussion about this uh, in regards to vertical transmission in NIDO. I was asking if we should be saying, as far as we know, and Jessica having a, a major in herpeticulture. Is that your actual major? What's your major? No, it was biology. Biology. It was um, lab, though. We ran around the bushes, so it doesn't really count. She's like, that's how scientists have to speak because they have to speak as if any possibility is a possibility until empirically proven not to be. But we have to handle our collections to the best of the information we have available. So having them on opposite sides of a basement, that's using the best knowledge that we have right now in your situation, is what I'm trying to say. So have they yeah. gotten re respiratory infections or they're just stable but have it? They have shown zero symptoms. They are all eating and growing like crazy. They've never had any issues with regurgitation, no nothing. Fortunately, most of, well, for better or worse, most of them are in the Central American localities. So like they stay smaller. So most of them, I don't have to worry about like moving up to like bigger cages or anything, which is part of what makes it easier for me to manage. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely been like, so at this point, I think all of most of the adults in my collection have been tested at least two or three times, like over a year plus period. And now I that original, like, that original new snake that you got, did that one test positive? Yes, he did. Once eventually. everybody else, once everybody yeah. else was showing symptoms and that snake had put on some weight okay now is that one stable or did that one have to go i ended up euthanizing him just because like i i was like there's still something weird with this snake just like the way he was eating it it felt like his it felt like his like he wasn't as strong as he should have been like muscle wise i've uh, definitely seen that one yeah they'll like be soft and, it, and not as responsive yeah not, and is that because they're exposed at birth or are they exposed in no, in no utero knows why like arena virus will be like i'm gonna have this pathology in this animal like i don't know but like soft big bellies they don't seem to digest good and they'll like hold on a stool or they'll just regurge but they don't have muscle tone 100 yeah. percent arena type symptoms in certain animals so are those that you're keeping in your uh arena positive colony that you can't breed those because it's yeah they have live babies so they're just they're just your friends that got yep, to survive. They're my friends. <laughs> Terrible situation. <laughs> like, we made it through 2020, guys. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad that you got to keep some of them. That's awesome. Because having to call everybody is it's really traumatic. It's a lot. Yeah. It was like, it took me, like, a long time to, like, move past it. Like, I didn't even want to go down to the basement. Like, mm -hmm. a long time. Um, yeah. I was just, and just the anxiety of not knowing. Like, while I was going through all the testing process... And even now, like, I still really improved my, like, my safety standards in the basement. Like, I, previously, I would definitely handle snakes and not wash my hands in between, especially if there were babies from the same litter, because I was assuming that everyone was fine. <laughs> and, and so now it's like, yeah, like, constant hand washing, glove wearing. I'm able to handle it as well as I can because I work from home. So it's pretty easy for me, like, to, like, I'll clean one or two cages. For the tubs, I have enough tubs where I can, like, put them in new clean tubs and then I rinse out the old tubs with like dawn soap put it outside all day to bake in the sun because I'm like here That's you awesome. go yeah yeah be nuked by the sun <laughs> <laughs> yeah the sun it's cheap the, and good the sun is cheap and good and does a fantastic job I was just wondering in like the trajectory of your collection when you knew IBD existed because it's always like a rumor. Was anybody ever like advocating for more testing to you before you had a problem? Or did you feel like sellers were telling you about the animal status? Or do you feel like you didn't get any messaging at all early on? I feel like I didn't hear any messaging early on. Like I said, like I've been pretty far removed from the reptile community. Like even though I've always been really involved, like I've always had reptiles. 
I never like really engaged in the community. I avoid Facebook pretty much mm -hmm. all the That's time. <laughs> yeah, in like the late idea, for sure. I feel like in the late nineties, early two thousands, there were a lot of forums uh, that I was a member of. Like there's a uh, Telbellas.net. That was my favorite. I was gonna say, why can't we go back to those days? Please? Yeah, it's like I was super <laughs> active on those. As soon as those, you know, went away and everyone moved to Facebook, I kind of checked out. Right. What was your handle? I'm so curious now. Do you remember it? You know, I don't remember what it was. What was your handle? Oh, oh, Vegeta was... Toboa Otaku. Of course, that's what it was. It was a uh, Zafod Forty Two. Were you using it in two thousand and four and two thousand and three? That was when I was the most active. I might have been a little bit, but probably not much because I graduated high school in '03, and I feel like I got into it more probably four and '05. Okay, were you uh '04 or were you '05? I was '04, but I was still was like on it. I know you I were like a mod, 12 I was like breeding, a... <laughs> breeding <laughs> boas in her bathroom. <laughs> no, that was a great forum because everyone who ran away from kingsnake.com forums from like the boa part of the kingsnake.com forums had like a solid group of like 50 to 100 people who would answer questions to new people that were correct regularly and it was well moderated. I don't know when it died, but it's sad that it did die. I thought about buying the domain. <laughs> Doing it I thought about it too. I put a watch on it to try and buy it. I feel like you guys um, are like soul sisters. <laughs> ooh, that's why we're getting yeah. married. It's gonna be yeah, amazing. totally. Podcast married. It's it's yeah. official. Mm -hmm. It's uh, I think it's the domain is owned by the boa file guy. I thought he owned redtailboas dot com or something. He bought it from Clay. Yeah. So maybe it was that, the .com one. I was at Redtail. There was RedtailBows.com. There's RedtailBows.net. Right. The cool I was on the, one was .net. Uh, that's not the cool one. Fuck. It's on the mainstream so the, one. The main one was where all like the normal dudes were. Like normal big breeders. So like Jeff Ryan yeah. would post his litters there. And I don't know. Like AllBows.com. What was his name? The name yeah. There was, there was like a couple of like other like somewhat smaller breeders. There was like Morgan's Boas. Mm-hmm. There's a couple others. I just, I just always think it's really funny when people are like, I've been in the boa industry for 30 years and my dick is so huge. And you're like, <laughs> oh, huge. If it was so huge, I would have known about you the seven years I was doing boas all over the internet. So obviously your dick isn't that huge. Maybe a little <laughs> bit, maybe a baby carrot. But like the people who like tout their penis around about how long they've been in the industry when I was also in the industry at the same time and don't remember them for shit. <laughs> Sorry, keep going. I was Yeah. No, that's You know what I mean? Totally like accurate. if you don't remember them from them then they weren't hot shit then. Well, who cares what they think? Yeah. But back to the super original question that went off on this tangent. Um <laughs> I <laughs> We lost it. That's how we roll we here. <laughs> I know. I, I was like something reason we went down this road. Uh yeah, so like I didn't hear about like arena like I didn't even know that that Arena virus was associated with IBD until I started all of this. And it was actually, I think, your Instagram post. Um, I did something or, good. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I saw like your, your post on testing. And that was, I was like, what is this testing this person speaks oh, no. of? Yeah. It's like, that is kind of what started it. And I was like, why doesn't everyone do this? This seems like a really good idea to add to our... Seems really smart to add to our <laughs> intake procedures and quarantine process. Yeah, like if more people tested, we could talk about it more. We would have a better idea of like, why are some of these boas positive but asymptomatic? Why are some not? Like, mm -hmm. we could potentially find whatever the trigger is that makes... Some bows go symptomatic and some not be. Or we could be like, oh, it's these two strains. When they get together, they have a party and they mm -hmm. kill the fuck out of your boa. It's not a sexy party. It's a bad party. Bad party. Bad party. Mm -hmm. Or no. maybe we could quit breeding boas that have it and eliminate it in future generations. Yeah. Weird. Like, it just... Weird. I, <laughs> Was yeah. it a post um, from 2020? Because that, like, that long ago? on Instagram or like a more recent post? I think it had to have been sometime in 2021. I, I feel like you would occasionally do posts of it was like a screenshot or something. Of, yeah, like, you've been all... posting the whole time that I've known who you were and that's two two plus years. 
Well, in like 2019, there was just like some pictures of goats and chickens and shit and like a random boa. Cause that's mostly what I had. But then I stopped doing Instagram for like three or four months and I had to kill a bunch of snakes. And then I came back on and I was like real pissed about it. So then I was like, I'm going to post every day. Fuck you people about arena or whatever. Okay, yeah, yeah it was probably I mean, was then when she was somebody. like, because that was it, her it was second definitely week out of colony collapse with arena. Because she had one when she was in high school, and then she had another one. You probably listened to that episode. You probably mm-hmm. heard the story, but yeah, I have now. Yeah, I have gone down all the rabbit holes of Arena <laughs> that I can find on the internet. Uh, Did you have as- any community support, or were you going through this all by yourself? I was going through this all by myself because, hmm. like, I just I don't have a lot of like local reptile friends. And I didn't want to go, like, go on Instagram and be like, hey, everyone, I'm hey, Marina. with Marina. So I was like, one, at the time, I was like, nobody's ever going to find somebody again. And then I was like, and I was also going to all this, all the people who would deny that Arena existed. And I was just like, I do not have the emotional, emotional capacity right now to get a fight with dumb bitches on the internet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, nope, not, not doing it. Yeah, so I went through this all alone. Me and a I bottle of whiskey. That, a bottle of whiskey for sure. I would have a bottle of tequila and join you with your bottle of whiskey. But I feel like, okay, so I don't like Discord, but I feel like what Jessica's doing with her Discord community under the umbrella of our podcast as well is creating that community where people who hear about it on our podcast or see us posting test results and message us privately, they can come onto that private server and they can get help, get advice and have more support we would preferably like to prevent anyone from going through what all three of us have gone through, which is, you know, euthanizing animals that we love and care about that could have been prevented. So we're trying to get that information out there so that they don't go through that. But when they, people are going through that and they are looking in the right direction and trying to handle it correctly, I think that that Discord is offering more of a community support. So it's not something that you're doing alone. Like, so when I went through it, I had Jessica and I don't, I don't think I could have done it if I didn't have her in my corner going like it's okay we're gonna get through this and it's gonna be okay and we're gonna on the other side it's gonna be like a new system and and we, this doesn't have to happen again you know like so i feel like i understand when people if that happens to them they completely leave the hobby because it's so it's so awful you so you like didn't the, leave the hobby yeah good job <laughs> yes good job mm-hmm. do you get Go like ahead, that, that like ptsd squirt every time you get an email from morale and you're like oh. yeah it yeah. is Every time that email comes in, I'm like, oh, do and I don't want to look at this. Because right now it's just like Schrodinger's results for like all my posts, both positive and negative. Well, in the future, I'm offering up Jessica's services. (laughs) I always forward her my results and I'm like, scale of one to bad. How is it? And she'll be like, it's it's not great, but it's okay. So you can look now. And so she'll tell me because I literally like will get almost like pass out because I'm so like when you're going through like the first rounds of testing everybody and then you're going through your second rounds of testing it's a lot and so she is always my uh my opener and i'm like how bad is the news <laughs> nice it's really hard it's nice to have... i think people don't people who aren't testing or haven't tested yet and like yeah it's a lot of work or something the emotional work of it is so much more work than the financial yeah. cost or whatever because you're absolutely processing like the betrayal of you hurt your animals you did it. It's your fault. And then you're like, fuck, I'm an asshole. And then I'm a bad person. Like, yeah. Like the animals betrayed me. Like I cared for them for five years. And like, I thought we were good. And I thought I knew what I was doing. And I'm an idiot. There's so many things on pack. And it's absolute torture for humans and animals. So we should test. Everyone should test in advance. Save all suffering. Well, and even for you, like you did test before you let him into your big room. Like that's. Well, I chose That's not to hard. test one from one good breeder who had had other negatives for me, but that was a mistake. That's why it's every snake gets tested. Because even if they have some negatives, they could have some positives. Yeah. Were made. So where did you go from there? Where did you go? So you avoided the basement, other than essential needs of the animals, obviously. How did you write your ship after everybody had been tested and they'd been separated and there was no more animals that needed to be euthanized? Where did you go from there? Yeah, so like definitely some of it was just time helped. Like I made it through the several rounds of euthanasia, let all of that settle, and having better practices in place for keeping the rest of my collection safe. 
I get obsessed with organizing things. And so I like color coded all of, I put like color code stickers and everybody's name tags to show like how many tests they'd had. Yep, I went through that too. <laughs> so like, just like doing like little things like that, like made me feel better. As soon as everybody made it through, I did like one round of tests. Well, I had like that initial huge round discovered all of the positives. And then I did another round of testing six months after that for most of my adults again, which confirmed all the ones that had tested positive previously tested positive again, all the ones that had tested negative previously tested negative again. So it's like, all right, cool. I now have like two testing done six months apart confirming these results. I've done like a third round of testing again on most of the negative ones, just because I was like, I just like need this for my own peace of mind. Your own and emotional well-being. Yeah. And so that definitely helped. I mean, it wasn't great on the wallet, but it wasn't that big of an expense compared to like what I've spent on some of these boas and just mm -hmm. emotional well-being. Like, big. yeah. Um, so it's worth a lot to feel like you can relax yeah. and breathe and feel like you've moved past it. Yeah. And like being on the Discord channel has also helped a lot. Just like being with other people who have gone through this. And I also just like really love learning new things. So while I hate the arena virus with every fiber of my being, I'm also like, ooh, virus, this is kind of interesting. <laughs> um, so like reading all the reports on it, like how it spreads and just all the things that we don't know about it yet. Hope we learn more. I have no idea. Like I learned about this at a time when I feel like we had several major like research papers come out fairly recently. So I think I was somewhat spoiled in that of like, oh, we'll get a new awesome study every two years. And I'm like, that's probably not a realistic expectation. Learning more about it did a mix of horrifying me more and also making me like feel a little bit more comfortable about it. The main thing that stresses me is even though I have like several females who've all tested negative, you know, for a long time, we seem to still not know like what triggers it to go like the viral load to like increase. So mm -hmm. I still treat everyone like they could be positive. <laughs> I'm like That's absolutely like, correct. Yeah. But I'm also just kind of aware that, you know, in three years I could breed some of these females that had tested negative four times and then the stress of breeding makes them pop a positive. And then it's like, well, great. <laughs> and I'll have a gravid boa who's positive to deal with that. It's like that is like one of the last kind of like lingering things that still stresses me out about boa breeding. And also why I wish more people would test so we could talk about this more and just be open about it. Mm -hmm. What is your um, breeding testing protocol, Jessica? So I know you do. I like you have to a do testing. pairs before they get together every fall. And then I'll do dams after they give birth to whatever product they were going to do. Like slugs or babies or whatever because that would be like a stressful event and i don't necessarily redo the males unless they are going to go for sale like i'm gonna you know, switch males or something how many have you had top positive after they've given birth one who wasn't positive otherwise but that, that's out of like 15 or something it's pretty good yeah that's that's my plan is test before pairing and then test the dam after she gives birth and right. Then, did you do did you do any pairing this year or you're still on a break from that because of the arena? I had two pairs that had babies this season. I had a litter in February and a litter in June. And I tested like the males I tested while the females were gravid and they were both negative. I didn't want to stress out the females while they were gravid, so I got to be super stressed out the entire time they were gravid, being oh. like, Oh maybe oh. <laughs> Yeah, I was like I was like I was optimistic because the males were negative. It's like, all right, a good sign. <laughs> that, like, he's not infected. The females were negative like, days after giving birth. So I was like, the only one I haven't tested in my collection is my June Rolls Bella. The same deal. She is gravid. The male who is with her is negative, and she was like far away from like everyone else who had like tested positive in my collection. And so like I'm pretty like sure that she'll be negative because like she hardly like, I hardly ever took out of her cage to be honest because she's seven feet and she's like I don't want to be out of my cage I'm mm -hmm. gonna sit here and lie under the heat shelf 
So I'm like, cool. You're going to hang out there and be safe in your little bubble. <laughs> Everybody's Lean safe in their little you. bubbles. <laughs> little bubbles. So, so she's the last did, one. That I have to tell. Did having litters, did that give you, revitalize you towards breeding or being a breeder? Or are you still feel like you're recovering from, from all the losses and this whole situation? It definitely helped me get back into it a little bit. Part of like what set me back was like a number of the snakes that I had to have euthanized for my older adult boa females. So that kind of derailed a couple of projects. And derail all your projects. Yeah. I was like, yeah. Cool, cool. And like a lot of my Central American projects are like dead in the water now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which honestly, I was kind of on the fence with some of them anyways. So I've kind of. I'm going in a new direction with like most of my projects. I'm getting super into pastel stuff. Probably just backing out of the Central American bows a little bit. I don't know. I have a love hate relationship with all of those localities. They also hate you. They do really <laughs> hate me. Oh man, those babies hate me. So much. Do you think that the big dogs in the boa pool are either responsible or tangentially responsible, or they have any sort of Complacency. <laughs> yeah, and just not telling people anything about it because they know about it. They just have decided that they don't want to tell people stuff about it. Would you have wanted to be told when you got like a high end boa, literally anything about its status? Or like people are always like yeah. accusing me of being like, you're, it's a conspiracy theory. Well, what explains their behavior besides they don't want to talk about it for whatever reason? I don't know. Like, yeah. how what, how do you process that? That they don't want to talk about it and they don't want people to figure it out and they just want to keep the status quo going of sometimes some boas die and sometimes they don't. I 100% think that they don't want to talk about it because then people are going to start asking for more testing and then they're going to be responsible with publicizing their test results or not publicizing, but like making them known to prospective buyers because I'm sure that they are testing. Like, there's just no way that they're not. I think one of the frustrating things about Arena is that, like, the vertical transmission is a bitch. Like, mm-hmm. it sucks. With Nido, you can really at least sucks. take the eggs and, like, separate yep. them so you don't lose the genetics. We don't have that option. And as we've, many of us have learned, uh, boas can test negative for a while and then pop a positive. It sucks. We're all dealing with it. Well, those of us who are testing are dealing with it. I just really feel like if we just talked about this more openly as a community, like we could talk through a lot of these issues. If folks are convinced that arena isn't real or it's not that big of a deal, cool. Buy your bow without testing or buy, like I dare those people to buy a bow that is positive. Like if you are so convinced that it's not real, I want to see you buy a positive $5,000 boa. Yeah. None of them will. That's the best part. Amen. Yeah. Because yeah. it's not a big like, deal, but they don't want it. So it must yeah. Be so to deal. me, like it can't be. It can't be like. It can't both be those both. things can't be true. <laughs> like either you think it's not a big deal, and you would buy that boa, or you're like, I'm actually not sure. It's okay to not be sure, mm-hmm. but just don't deny it. Or call us Karens because we're talking about it. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's like the main reason for our podcast. I mean, it's fun. It's quippy. We talk about interesting things. But the main reason is we're trying to have a normal conversation that includes talk of testing and talks of disease. And so we just try to like sneak it in there. <laughs> and so people are just like, oh, they're just talking about NIDO like every day. Like, oh, should I be thinking about NIDO? Or, oh, they're talking about arena virus all the time. Should I be thinking about arena virus? And I think that that's working. I mean, yeah. Like, but that's what everybody needs to start doing is it needs to come out in normal conversations and it needs to be normalized. And then I think we can come to the table as adults and decide what we're going to do with that information. I mean, it's like the movie, you know, don't look up. Okay. (laughs) Sure. We're all going to die. That's cool. We need those dead boa jobs. We got to bury boas. (sighs) It's just, it's, it's, it's frustrating. To be painted because I am the opposite of a Karen and I am the opposite of getting in anyone's business or telling people how to live or how to believe or how to feel like that is not me at all. But 
like the experience that you go through where you have to euthanize animals that you love and you have to feel all the turmoil. I mean, it's not just like the day you euthanize them. Like you have to go through the process of they're sick. I'm worried. They're at the vet. I'm worried. They're sick. Oh, they're not getting better. Oh, I'm doing do research. Oh, crap. This sounds like maybe what I have. Now I got to do testing. And then I got to wait for the results. And you know, I mean, there's just like this so, this it's huge emotional grief. I've yes, it's huge. Like three extra times. You're yes. Like, you got to like restart. Right? <laughs> yeah, this test is wrong. I'm going to do it again. You know, like I did that. Uh, like, no, I couldn't have possibly given this to my little buddy. Yeah. <sighs> he's just such a nice snake. There's no way he's sick. <laughs> So I, yeah, I'm loud about it and I talk about it, but that doesn't make me a Karen. I just literally don't want people to feel how you felt, how I felt, how Jessica's felt. Like, that's not a Karen. Like, that's somebody who gives a shit. Like, I'm giving a shit about a future heartache that you could have. And I don't even know you. Like, it doesn't affect me. It doesn't affect my business because I'm testing. And so if you're not and your whole colony collapses, that's, that's your problem. But I'm trying to help you, you know, not nag you to death or you know, yell in your face. I'm just literally trying to help you prevent a situation that I've had to experience that was horrible. And and I, I still feel like we get painted as these obnoxious Stupid Karen's. Women. Stupid oh, women. God. Shut your mouth. Go back to the kitchen. What Jan is getting at is thank you for coming on and saying that any of our incoherent garbling has ever given you any sort of consolation in any way and helped in any way it's amazing because to that's hear why we're that... here uh, fuck yes. whatever else we're dumb crap we're doing it mostly exists to normalize testing and save people in any way possible thank you yeah thank you guys like it it really was like just eye-opening and made me feel better about my situation and made me learn like how i could avoid this in the future or at least like significantly lower the chances of it happening again mm-hmm but right. you literally didn't do anything wrong. You did test. You did quarantine for six months. The snake did seem to be getting normal or, you know, like, you literally did all the things you were supposed to do. It wasn't like you were like, oh, I'm just, whatever, throw it in my rack the day I get it. You know, like, you literally did all the steps. I mean, and that's how important this disease discussion is. Because even if you do it right, even if you do quarantine for six months, even though you did a panel more needs to be done still because you still had it get into your colony, even doing things correctly, in my opinion. That's why the information, like you sharing your story, I feel like that's really important for people to hear that doing it a little bit isn't isn't enough. Like we have to, you, now you know, like your biosecurity and your little bubbles and you're like, I mean, you think about it and it's such a more almost anal <laughs> OCD type way now, whereas most people are like, oh, it's fine, which is exactly how I am. And I'm working towards being jessica anal because every time i hear a talk i'm like oh i need to do that i need to do that better you need to do the deep and analysis on yes. your biosecurity protocols correct correct anyway thank you thank you so much for sharing your story we can talk about fun stuff now if I you know, want fun to. stuff okay <laughs> what are your thoughts on img oh man just do it just do it just let it go just let it all out I just let it. it go break my heart it it's so okay <laughs> i hate that img isn't everything i hate that i go on morph market and it's like Hello, all the things. Motley, IMG. I'm like, can we not throw IMG in goddamn everything? <laughs> like, I was annoyed at VPI for a while because I felt like VPI was getting tagged along. And now I'm like, I don't even care about VPI. Fucking IMG is just everywhere. And I was like, I don't care about your funny brown boa, okay? It's cool out of one thousand times and the rest of the time you took a perfectly good awesome pattern boa and you're like how can i fuck this up img for the winner <laughs> how's that for an answer i love img i don't <laughs> think i love img in literally everything i there's select few img combos that just really make my heart pitter patter if i ever own a boa it will have img in it but it's okay brown snakes are ugly <laughs> Well, it's the, like the VPI IMGs that turn brown because they're like really cool as babies, but they like are very consistently turd colored as adults. Yeah. Uh, they just can't help it. it. And especially <laughs> if you like put a bunch of shit in them because then they're like weird yeah, uniform I, shit color. I don't know. I don't like understand that. the like 12 combo gene. But it's like, why? I like the really black ones that are like iridescent-y. I think they're really Yeah, cool. those are cool. Well, this but is like, like a straight IMG no or an IMG anery 
So like a simple yeah. combo is the best Correct. combo at that point. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think people like abuse IMG because it's a an easy way to add dollar signs to like a female that is mature but not very valuable. Like they have a call slung glow. You can just go get an IMG head call and just make the litter more expensive relatively easily. But there's no real necessary benefit to that pairing except for that. Well, it's yeah. nice to hear that there are some problems in the boa <laughs> the boa breeding thought process because you guys do a lot more line breeding and I think that ball python industry could benefit from doing that or you do a lot more breeding just the best whereas I think ball pythons it's like okay well it has what I want so who cares if it looks good you know and I think that you guys do a better job at that and so it's nice to hear sometimes that you don't do a better job. No there's like a bunch of more <laughs> chuckle fucks in boas too yeah aren't really there yeah. with the art the, the thing. I feel like there's a lot of morph chasing. Just like, oh, VPI is cool. I'm gonna add VPI to everything. Like, even if it's a garbage v- VPI bow that they have, like mm-hmm. they're adding. It. Like, there's a lot of people who get into bows. Like, I'm gonna breed my normal boa to hypo. I'm like, cool, 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 cool. <laughs> and they're like, I haven't had boas for very long. And I'm gonna throw them together. Okay, How are you gonna sell all those babies? Oh, well, they'll be easy to sell like yeah <laughs> maybe last year they were but you can tell this year it's already going tits up and yep. not in a good way it's up everything mm-hmm. just as jessica predicted it's a savant type of thing all right favorite line of albino oh man you're gonna hate me for this mm-hmm. i'm on team call all the way i knew you was gonna say that <laughs> i like lava okay like the lava line is cool <laughs> Okay, what about when their eyeballs are falling out? Do you like that part? Is that part cool? I admit to not liking that part. I have been lucky in that I have never had any eyeball issues with any of my albino crossings. They're coming. Is that a random occurrence or is that... Yeah, it it feels like it's 5 to 10%. You just have to like hit enough visuals in your litter and eventually you'll get it. Some people claim like their lines never do it and they can claim that if they want to, but I don't... I don't have any evidence. They're just that making snake food than and then taking malaria. a picture of the litter. <laughs> yeah. It seems like it's just luck. Yeah, I just, I don't like, I think VPIs look cool, like for other people, but I have like limited <laughs> space and I'm like, I'm never going to have like hundreds oh, of bows. Yeah. I say this and in 10 years, I'm going to have hundreds of bows. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I have to be like very specific about what projects I am like willing to do. And so VPI is off the list. I do have some of the the woman caramel stuff because I like paradigms. So I feel like there are just not very many people who are doing stuff with paradigm. Like everyone got on the VPI train. It was like, Mm -hmm. cool, we're going with this one. I'm like over here playing with my little paradigm. Like, cute. Well, people are too dumb to understand like parahets. I think that is literally the whole problem because they look quite similar to a VPI. They do. To me. But are sort of more versatile because you could get either option out of it if you wanted to do Jana. Hey, for those of us in the back that don't know what you're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. She (laughs) saw my look of confusion. So (laughs) Charlotte Albino is, looks like a T negative, but it's probably a kind of T plus that's so minimal production that it basically looks T negative, but it happens to be a Lilic with two T pluses, Prodigy and Boa Woman Caramel. And maybe Russian blonde, but we don't, I don't think I know that as like a definitive fact. Do you know that, Maddox? I do not. Okay. Maybe. There's not enough Russian blondes left to even test. But yeah, those things together make something, an allelic combo that looks like a VPI, basically. So it has like a ruby eye and it's really bright, but it's a touch darker than a VPI. But they were like the hot du jour combo in the... What do you think? Like the aughts to yeah. tens before once VPI dropped in price enough, then it took over because the VPI line existed yeah. in when did they find it ninety nine or something, something like that. Like yeah, it just for some reason like VPI didn't take off right away. I guess just just because it was so expensive, and then everyone was like, oh, this paradigm thing is cool. I want to say basically Boas was like mm-hmm. one of the big name breeders who got like really into paradigms. So then they got really popular, and then the price on VPIs dropped. 
and everyone it just felt like right. abandoned right. Boehm and caramel and paradigms and we're like we're on the vpi train from here on out yeah it's um, like an, an it was easier a weird way shift. to get the look so that makes sense too because you just you just need a head to head you don't have to necessarily like hit the yeah. super i want somebody i don't know how you feel about it to do pure Boehm and caramel selective breeding just make Boehm caramel nice use pastel lineages or whatever because sharp has bad eyeballs too so like if i could go buy like a really nice selectively bred pure bowl and caramel that was not on accident a dark paradigm or whatever i would prefer that and would pay money for that pro tip take your bo- your paradigms and mix them together there we go Mm-hmm. to something nice so you have paradigms do you want to run sharp by itself separately with call or is that too many snakes? That's like 10 million snakes now. That's that's probably too many snakes. Because I also love Argentine boas. And I have like multiple projects. I'm probably going to build out around those. And I really love Doom Rolls boas. Which don't have any morphs. But I just love Doom Rolls boas. I don't really have any interest in just doing like a sharp project. I really only have the interest in like Paradigm and Boa Woman Caramel. That's literally the only reason why I own any sharp boas. Okay, <laughs> just for better. that project. Because <laughs> most people think to them that sharp is a better of the two of call and sharp because it's a little bit more expensive and maybe holds color better depending on who you think. But that's all yeah. lineage based in my opinion too. But Yeah, I think that was true until <laughs> like some people started really focusing on bringing out color and like the call line with like the lava line lipstick. At this point, they just slap lipstick onto like every call bow and like, yeah, it's a lipstick <laughs> line. I'm like, I don't think that's true anymore. <laughs> it has <laughs> orangish saddles. That is the only criteria now. <laughs> yeah it's like that that one is like overlined but like um i'm a big fan of like noah's boas and i've recently got like a couple things from him and it's so like that i was like what i'm interested in just is just making ridiculously pink and orange call boas so that's sort of like why i like that line because i like pink and orange boas so <laughs> so does everybody i know uh, can i say i you probably heard it on the podcast but like it's my like deepest ambition that boa breeders decide to like other things too. I feel like everybody who has a pastel project is going for the same kind of like hyper saturated clean look. There's other forms of pastel or other forms of selective breeding with an amorph and I feel like we don't do any of those anymore. We used to do them a long time ago. I think it's because everyone is like not everyone but like a lot of the big name breeders and a lot of folks who are just getting into boa breeding like everyone is morph chasing. So like whatever trend they see coming like oh that's what I'm gonna do because that's where the money is. And spoiler alert, it is really hard to actually make money like selling reptiles. So you should have projects around stuff what? that you like. Yeah, like <laughs> this idea of like, I'm going to spend a whole bunch of money on these boas and they're going to breed and then I'm going to make a million dollars and I'm going to retire and have a pool with a whole bunch of hotties walking around in bikinis mm-hmm. and it's going to be great. And my sports car. Sorry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Just cleaning that sports car while they're holding one of my boas and just eating a cheeseburger Mm -hmm. like american dream or a banana hammock so many options (laughs) favorite line of pastel go i mean well now i'm on ferrari just because i picked up that Mm. awesome ferrari pastel i think the problem with a lot of the pastel lines these days is they just got so like outbred with everything or like everyone just starts slapping the label on them (laughs) Um, when I came back, so, there were 10 additional pastel lines that I left with. Yeah. And I was like, is this not too many? Because I feel like it's too many. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like 90% of the ones I see marked as pastel, I'm like, hey, right. <laughs> like this doesn't, like, they used to be really cool. Do you but, think like, we should, remember a long, I don't know if you remember this, but a long time ago, they used to go like pastel dream. And then a lineage, like a last name of the person who worked it. Like it might have been related to Jeff Ronnie's stuff, but they worked it into their whatever. And it was still a pastel dream, but it was like three generations removed. So it was sort of that person's line. So instead of calling it Flamingo line, they just still called it pastel dream. They just clarified it with who produced it. Do you think that would be a better system than Sugar Ferrari Red Rum? Yeah, like all the names are like meaningless to me now. I, and like, I don't know if this is true or not. It feels like there are just so many people more breeding now than there were, God, 20 years ago. Ugh, the odds were a long time ago. <laughs> Which, like, I'm not saying it's, like, a bad thing, but 
then it's gonna get like really confusing if everyone is now putting their names on things like i feel like it would just gradually become meaningless as everything else is now meaningless with the pastel lines so i don't know like, i don't really have like a good answer for it yeah i don't i don't either but it, there's definitely been a an unnecessary increase in labeling for pastel lineages it gets okay to define the line they're not a, that's not a new morph yeah uh, it's not a, and it probably came from jeff ronnie's stuff anyway you know what i mean it's just they found it at a pet store you know removed from whatever and they're like it's new or you know and then there's pastel shit floating around in the wild also yeah so that i'm very confused about it and i think it's a it's a disservice to the boa market to like confuse their potential buyers more with a selling stuff as pastels that aren't pastels because the name somehow magically transfers the morph phenotype to every baby that that female produces for the rest of her life no matter who she's paired with <laughs> yeah and then b it's the same as some other things so it's yeah it's not... i think a lot of people don't understand like what pastel means what is and like they do to you uh to me in general it means like, like a very clean pattern is what I look for. Specific lines are associated with more like color saturation. Ferrari pastels, I'm assuming like insanely clean pattern and ridiculous color saturation. Monster tails, like we're known for like their tails, but like again, like the clean pattern is like kind of the main thing that I am looking for in most pastels. I think people assume that when they breed a pastel to another boa of any kind, they're like, all of these babies are now pastels even the ones that have a super dirty pattern. <laughs> it's like, do you think side medallions are a works. requirement to be clean to be a pastel? You know how some I people are it, like, if the side medallions have any black at all, it doesn't count as pastel. It counts as pastel lineage. What do you think about that? Well, like this is where things get weird. Like if you don't know the ancestry, like the lineage of that boa, like was it mixed with like Arabic or something? Like was it mixed with a pattern boa that is known for causing speckling like on the mm -hmm. side medallions and its sides like like then what <laughs> um i think the boa like, lords should come down and be like because i've seen different interpretations and there are animals that most of the pastels on morph market now even from pastel lineages i don't even think are count as pastels to me based on like the old definition like where the top yeah. is Almost the saddles are almost completely stonewashed. They might have color, but they don't have black. And the side medallions are completely gone. And the base is almost perfectly clear of speckles. And then color is a bonus. But that sort of like hyper clean look is not in almost any pastel lineage anymore. So like this the definition has shifted. So, yeah. So I'm not in charge, but I don't know who is. <laughs> I think this. Fucking I don't know either. Horse and pony show is like run off with the bow market, and they don't know how to describe their product anymore correctly yeah yeah none of our morphs really make sense anymore <laughs> it's all it's all just fucking black uh, magic Woo! 100 <laughs> percent. i don't want to like shit on boas they did hurt my feelings so i'm mad at them but even though i've had boas again for three years i don't know where i want to fit back into the boa market like i have some morph stuff and i have some mixed stuff and i got the little longicata and i'm like i can't find the animals like versions of the animals I once had that arena virus killed. I can't find them. They don't exist anymore. So the project I wanted to get back into doesn't exist. I think everybody bred bloods like El Salvadorian stock to everything and Nick stock yeah. to everything. So everything looks very weird to me and small and central looking in the morph world. And I'm like, what the fuck is any of this? How am I going to selectively breed this dog shit? It's not even what I wanted... <laughs> <laughs> I, and I can't fucking find I want a normal boa with the phenotype that I want and I can't find it it's been three years isn't that insane that all of the boas that looked like that 20 years ago are gone they're dead where are they please someone tell me someone tell me please oh they're, oh, they're dead and buried in a whole <sighs> bunch of backyards <sighs> yep they're, they're gonzos <sighs> the closest thing I ever saw was a old decrepit person on fauna classifieds was like i've been working on these boas for 10 years i'm like that's it there it is so i need to find an elderly person with boas from 20 Did you years buy ago. one no it was like it was an old ad 
Oh, an old ad. Okay. So we need to find yeah. old people who have boas in their basement that are the kind of Colombian stock or like partial Panamanian tiny bit because of hypo that used to exist a long time ago. Because that shit was better. Than whatever's going on now. Like it's cool that they're smaller for pet purposes, but their phenotypes are not the same. I feel like that's why pastel lineages have like gone off the, the deep end. They're much dirtier and grungier than they ever were. Like I have a picture of a pastel I paid two hundred dollars for in two thousand and two, that looks better than any pastel I've seen since. Not in terms of color saturation, but in terms of clarity and cleanness of pattern, and absolutely no black on side medallions or top. Okay, that has to be the thumbnail. <sighs> Fuck you, bitch! <laughs> Making me go. <laughs> You said you had a picture. <laughs> we must see this uh, picture. It's got to be a picture of our guest. Or one of her oh, okay. I mean, like, put it below or something. <laughs> I'll the, put it the... on, like, the Facebook group or something. Okay. But that already existed 20 years ago. So we ruined it, I think. I mean, th- there are good pastel images. I think RC Pastel, on average, looks the best. What do you think about that? Oh, they're so... Oh, yeah. They're, and maybe like, Red Rum, too. They're so cool. Yeah, they're amazing. The, they're very the, clean too. He brought color and clarity and kept it. Yeah, that definitely is what got me back interested in my blood project because a bunch of the boas I still have that are positive but not showing symptoms were part of my blood project. So I'm like, cool, not breeding you guys anymore. And I had mostly written off that project. I was like, I'm just going to tap out was all the Central American localities, not going to do bloods anymore. And then those damn RC pastels showed up that were 100% het for blood. And I was like, this is it. This is how we make the blood morph interesting again. What about sangria? Would you want to use sangria instead? Because it's the Colombian equivalent of blood, but it's just rarer to find. Yeah, like finding it is hard. Yeah, I also like a lot Dynasty of the... who has it that I know of. Yeah, I like a lot of the Nick bloods, like berry blood. Can't find a berry blood to save my life. This, mm-hmm. I've heard they've imported a lot of berry bloods and they pop positive a lot. I don't know if it's like a lineage thing or a provider thing or a person who does it thing. I'm winking for everybody at home on the audio. <laughs> <sighs> well, maybe they, I uh, could Berry find... bloods are very nice, though. They look... Yeah. They deserve their name. Well, when I have our new house in a few years and I expand Snake Town into an even bigger Snake Town... Oh, is it called I will Snake fa- Town? That's fun. Yeah, Snake Town. Let's go to Snake Town. Yeah. yeah. I um, like that. Take a trolley. Yeah. Ding, ding. Ding, it's ding. Like Mr. Roger. Yeah. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother. It's very oh. wholesome for this podcast. Uh, kind of weird. Okay. Favorite locality? <laughs> so, like, when I first, like, got into, like, locality-specific boas, it was all, like, the Central American ones. And El Salvador's were first because I loved, like, the blood boas. And I still like them. Like, I love their size. Like, having a four-foot mm-hmm. boa that it's like the little dog sy- like syndrome, but in a boa. It's like, I am a badass. <laughs> like, you are barely four feet. And you are significantly, like, thinner body-wise right. than other ones. So I really liked those. I do like a lot of the ones that were, I mean, they were always there. But I feel like we're seeing more coming out of South America of, like, specific locality bows down there which is cool because now everything has been muddied in our more system so seeing a pure colombian i'm like oh look at that that thing's nice <laughs> yeah I, it's crazy because like most boas were mostly colombian and nobody wanted yeah. like a partial nick cross or whatever they were like Ugh. now they're m- mostly partial nick or else yeah and crosses which, which I so don't different. get. I, I like the Central American localities, like when you want a small boa, and some of them have like cool morphs, but crossing them into like, you know, what were mostly Colombian boas and morphs, with like obviously a little bit of Panama thrown in because of hypo, but that shit was so many generations back, right, like it doesn't down. matter. Yeah. Um, like, why would you add a dark, kind of muddy ish pattern to your project? For yeah, like there's like I've seen a couple of people have been like, oh yeah, I did a Colombian Nick cross litter, like just normals of each. And I'm like, why? <laughs> that used to be so frowned upon in like Kingsnake.com. Yeah, you would be like driven off the site. Now people just do it just to make show fodder. But like everything halfway looks like that now. 
So it's just, I think we've lost something. We've lost something, which was like the pure-ish Colombian morph boas. So yeah. So it's worth if you yeah. have stuff that you think is high percent Colombian and you want to keep it going. Everyone should be encouraged to keep it going by not, you know, immediately getting a blood boa and being like, I'm gonna make whatever red dragons. Yeah. You know. And like whenever I do locality stuff, like I had projects specifically around like El Salvador boas. And I would buy from people who I was very confident that they were selling me a pure locality bow or at least as like pure as you could assume based on like multiple generations back. But I would buy from breeders who basically had the receipts to back it up and being mm-hmm. like, this is where I, you know, I got this pair as an import. Here are like the three generations I've bred since then versus somebody who's like, yeah, sure. It's a pure Nicaraguan. It's dark looking. See, mm-hmm. look how dark it is. <laughs> how <laughs> pretty like, it is. Buy it. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's a time and a place for that kind of stuff too, but it has to like fit the the phenotype, and it's obviously not a locality anymore. It's just like you're fitting the phenotype. Yeah, life's hard. Bows are hard. Bows are hard. Yeah, tough. Are there any morphs besides IMG that you think are like criminally overrated in VPI or localities? I feel like there was one the other day that I <laughs> oh. All of the trendy morphs, I just don't like. I feel like I'm stuck in the early aughts where I'm like, I just like me a nice jungle or a nice single gene motley. Mmm, that's the stuff right there. Those, like, fire boas, like the pregnant belly boas, whatever you want to call them. You don't, I don't like think fires they, at all? I don't like fires at all. I'm I like, love fires. So no. Nope. Are you into fire really heavily? Mm-hmm. I know we're we're just on completely opposite sides <laughs> when it comes to the boa morph <laughs> world. It's okay, that's what makes life fun. Yeah, like you have your projects, I got my projects. It's all good. I don't know. I just find them kind of boring to look at. Um, what about I the feel RC like a lot of their heads are weird. Where they're like pale but pale pink, like saturated nope. pink. No, you're all about nope. saturation. Yep, mm-hmm. all about that saturation. Yeah, just can't can't get in. I feel like their heads look weird too. Um, their heads do look weird. Yeah. Especially the, like the saddle, you know, the head spear reduction and stuff. But I don't know if it's, people have told me, they're like, it's only because they're part Amarelli. And I'm like, yeah, that's probably part of it. But to me, the actual fire morph itself looks physically different than a non-fire sibling. Like there's something in the skin difference. They seem fine, but like their yeah. skin is thin and different. The scales are different. I, yeah. I really like faded, boring snakes that are gray and just really boring as boring as possible <laughs> so fire is like right up my alley morph wise yeah mm-hmm. i really like i like the pattern morphs more than anything else that's why like i love jungle i love motley so that's why stuff like fire and, and img just has zero interest to me like right because cool, that would obliterate you out, what you like the best yeah you took out everything cool about that boa <laughs> nice 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 good job you ruined it <laughs> <laughs> do you think the kraken is polygenic or monogenic hmm I'm I'm about to find out. I got some Krakens in my collection now. No idea what I'm going to do with them. The Kraken thing to me is weird. I am definitely curious to breed it. I am not sure. My Ferrari Pastel will be ready to breed maybe in the spring, most likely next fall of 2023. And I'm undecided if I'm going to pair her with that Kraken that I picked up from Noah recently. Because that would take away pattern and you like pattern. His stuff does have yeah. a lot of color. Yeah, but that one is like a, that male is like a double dose lava line. Um, so I'm like, mm, Ferrari Pastel, that's het call for lava line. Mm, that's right up my alley. I don't know. Like Noah did a really good video on it on his Instagram feed, like where he goes over it like with the side medallion, so reverse stripe. I feel like this is polygenic just mm-hmm. from the, like, from the little bit about it I've seen. And like the inconsistencies in the litters, for like which ones are displaying those properties and which ones mm-hmm. aren't, it doesn't seem like it's in complete dominant situation. Mm-hmm. Seems like it's polygenic. Well, I got two Krakens in my collection now, so. Yeah, what I want to say is if it's polygenic or monogenic, people still like it. Like if they're pretty, the animals have nice selective breeding yeah. properties to it. So it doesn't hurt the project, but the amount of people who both shit on it weirdly in public and then like, or defend it as absolutely monogenic is pretty, there's like a definitely sides there. But yeah. I bought one from Noah also. It's dead now. Nice. It got a rainvirus. Oh. <laughs> but oh. uh, <laughs> uh, while it was here, it was very attractive. I yeah. don't think it came, it didn't come with a rainvirus. They received it from me. 
It was your welcoming gift. Oh, I know. Good. Congratulations. <laughs> and she had the biggest <laughs> fucking head for her size. She had like one of those Amarale heads. I was like, Ooh. I don't know where you came from, but I'm into it. Because <laughs> I, I like a, I don't know, some of them have like mom heads really early. There's just an authoritative quality to a boa that could like beat you to death with its head. <laughs> yeah, I'm into it. So you have Mexican Black Kings, Blood of Carpet, Hondos. Are these uh, intention to breed or are they just pets or what are you doing with those? A mix of both. I'm also remembering the episode you guys did on people who have art collections. <laughs> Noah's art collections. Yep. Yes. She's like, oh, shoot. And, yeah, the entire time I was listening to that episode, I was like, oh, God. Guilty. I'm triggered. Guilty. Oh. Yeah, like, I just like snakes in general. So, like, I love having different species to work with. Boas are what I primarily breed, but I love Mexican black king snakes. And I don't know if I just lucked out with my particular pair. They've never bitten me ever. They've never even tried mm -hmm. to bite me. They're just very curious and I love it. I walk by her cage. One of them's in the tub. My female's in a cage. She'll be like hiding in her log in the back. I'll side open the glass door and her little head will pop up out of the log. And she'll like do like the little like periscope like look around thing. She'll see me. What are we doing today? <laughs> yeah, she'll just like come down and like if I hold on my hand she'll just like crawl up it and be like cool this is fun. And like the male is the same way. Like they both immediately pop up and don't try to bite me the way that my boas do when I my open cow cage. King are like everything is food. They're like immediately trying to swallow your fingers the minute yeah. you touch them. After my... a few minutes you can get them out of food mode and then they're then they're fun. But like literally you have to just be like don't touch the head. <laughs> that's what I was down. expecting. Mine are not like that at all. Oh, that's and I, really cool. I don't know if it's like a Mexican black king snake thing versus Callie's, but like I've seen videos of people like with their Mexican black king snake, you know, trying to swallow their finger. Literally, yeah. No, um, I think it, you just lucked out and have a really good pair. Hopefully, that yeah. that produces good babies. Yeah, I'm curious. Mm -hmm. The Hondos that I got are a different story. And see, this is why I, I like stayed away from milk snakes for so long, because. Well, I don't love being bit. I can deal with it. I hate being mussed or pooped on or <laughs> peed on. No. So you don't do have a scat fetish like, is what you're telling us. Yes. Like mm -hmm. my, my partner and I have like a list of things, you know, like number one is no golden showers. Mm -hmm. And like number two <laughs> was list. like. Your nose. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he's always like, you are such a fucking prude, man. Like, <laughs> no golden showers, no, like, poop play, just, ugh. Yeah. Boring life. Um, boring life? You mean you don't want to, like, hold out an ice cream cone under a glass <laughs> table? <and walk? laughs> Sounds like a yeast infection nope. waiting to happen, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> no, happening. I don't like that. Um, <laughs> so, so you don't like your Hondos pooping on you, is what you're saying? No, and, like, the male is, like, very timid. Like, he's just scared of life. And they're a year old at this point, so honestly, I was expecting them to not be so scared of life, but I was wrong. The female is a psychotic asshole. I open her tub. They have pretty deep substrate in them because they apparently love to burrow. And so, like, they're always, like, underneath the burrow. So I open the tub, and it's just like, where are you? <laughs> and the male stick will... my hand in there. <laughs> yeah, the male will hide. Like, I had to search for him. The female will be like, Tub's open, going for it. <laughs> and she just comes flying out with her like mouth open and it's like That's I'm how my take kings you are. Out. They're just like Yeah. Ah. <laughs> yeah. She's insane. And they do like the flailing, like tail going mm -hmm. everywhere. And they're but they're so tiny. I'm like, I don't wanna hurt you, but you are just flailing around like crazy. So I'm trying to get them to calm down, but it's the Discord channel's fault. They were the ones who <laughs> just promoted my it? bad wrong, habits wrong python tricked you into it i don't even oh, remember which one of them okay. it was but like, i think they all ganged up there. on me <laughs> yeah they were like you want hondos and i was like i i do love i really love my king snakes and i wanted to get like some like colubrids so i was like oh like i looked at rat snakes there were a couple other ones that people brought up should have gotten the climax one. they're still the best they don't do that like fucking mouth feeder shark thing in the cage <laughs> They are like really like acute and aware and they'll watch you, but they don't. My stupid little, it's like a little worm. What the fuck is it? Oh, the broad banded uh, bamboo rat. He does uh, that. He does that. He'll come up out of the substrate like a fucking graboid, even though he looks like nothing but a little, <laughs> little unicorn fart. I'm just like, did you survive in the wild? I'm not. 
I'm not convinced this species is real because it's not a good strategy for <laughs> for making it to try to eat people. I have red-sided garters and they love to musk and they are tiny and they do the same like the tail flap yeah. and like but they're real fun. They're not aggressive. They're just real spazzy. Yeah. But now that it's my they're real aggressive feeders, but you can cohab them. But I have one who's the biggest female. She is real. Can I say cunty on the podcast? Sure. She's she's real cunty. So like if they'll have like a pinky in their mouth and they'll be swallowing it and she'll just come out of nowhere and just like grab it and rip it out of their mouth. <laughs> I mean, like they could be halfway swallowing this pinky and she's like, nope, that's mine, bitch. And so I, I have to like tongue feed them in separate corners of the <laughs> enclosure because I was taking them out to feed them all individually, but that was they weren't trusting me at that point. Cause you're like digging yeah. around in there. They're in a bioactive, but I'm like digging around and like yanking them out. And so then they didn't want anything to do with me. And I wanted them to be like, they wouldn't come out to bask and I wanted them to be more of like a show snake. And so now I'm like tongue feeding them all pinkies in their own little corners and stuff, but they are so friendly. So now whenever I walk by, they're like, Hey, hey yeah. you got a pinky for me. It's pretty funny. I'm so yeah. jealous that you have those. Like they're definitely so like fun. on my short list of when we eventually have another house and I have a bigger office. I'm like, all right, those are some of the snakes that are not going to be in snake town and are going to be like a display cage mm. in my office. They're in my living room. They're, they're so much fun. Yeah. So much fun. I love, love keeping garters. It's my kids will stand there for an hour and just watch them and they'll like move their finger across the glass <laughs> and they'll like follow. I mean, they're so fun. So adorable. Really fun. But they're not quite big enough for me to feel comfortable handling them yet. They're almost a year old. So yeah. I think once they're just a little bit bigger, then we'll start handling them. But they are, they're like, even especially compared to like a brand new ball python, they're just these little, yeah. little noodles. And so I, I don't, they're just too teeny for me to feel like I can hold them. Yeah. I don't even care about like holding them. I'm like, when I eventually have like a bioactive display set up for them, I'm like, cool, you're going to live in here forever and I'll like clean your cage. But I have so many other snakes like handable I can hold. snakes. Yeah, oh, like I, I have a toke gecko next to me. Like I freaking never handle him. I see people posting videos of their like tame toke. I'm like, well, that was mine a lot is a psychotic to murderer. To tame toke level. Yeah, they were dedicated. Yeah, I'm like nope. I'm just gonna go <laughs> ahead and hang out with my crested geckos. <laughs> <laughs> is that what you have behind you? Yes, that was my. I wanted to have something in the office that I saw. The snakes have to stay in the basement. That was also on the list the of list. rules with me and my yeah. partner yep uh snake stay in basement um so i have a leopard gecko in here who i literally never see once a week i lift up his cave and i'm like cool you're still alive good he never comes out uh the toke gecko is also always hiding and i was like i'm really tired of having two cages in my office of critters i never I don't see, see. Mm -hmm. um, but you I do see your your crusties sometimes today. yeah uh one of them is very shy um i named them Vi and cupcake from arcane and so Cupcake is always hiding in the back, and Vi will come out sometimes. Um, but they were like retired breeders from a friend of mine, so like they were adults when I got them. Yeah, they're cute. They got the mm -hmm. cute little faces. But yeah. geckos are a lot of work. There's mm -hmm. so much more work than snakes. My kid wants leopard geckos in her room, and I'm like, why? Can't you pick something cooler? <laughs> yeah. My last one who I had, she was 16 or 17 when she died. She was really cool. Like, she would be out all the time. I was oh, like, okay. you know you're supposed to be nocturnal, right? And she was like, nope, I'm going to explore my cage during the day. And she would just sleep, like, on top of her hide. Like, she was always out. She was super cool. And so, in my head, that was just how all leopard geckos were. Right. And then when I got my new boy, he was just like, yeah, no, I'm going to stay in this cave forever. <laughs> He's still a fat little thing. I'm like, I... I never see him eat. I just give him food and the food and it disappears. disappears. <laughs> and he is just like Jabba the Hutt, just hanging out in his little cave. <laughs> so, I, yeah, my a friend of mine, they have kids and they wanted pets. And I was like, well, you can get leopard gecko, but you're not going to see them. They're kind of boring. And they ended up going with green anoles. Because I had like a spare big cage. I was like, you that can't hold weird. them. Yeah, you can't hold them. They're you can't okay hold with them. looking at them. They're okay with looking at them, right. and you can tong feed them. And so they would get really excited about feeding time because the anoles are so fast and so active. Mm -hmm. um, and they do the throat thing where they fan out their throat. The and 
That's the sexiest yeah. push up I've ever seen. Yeah. Me personally. I've it's the only time I've wanted to have sex with a lizard recently. Like green and all push up, man. Yeah. I don't you know, know like, is that on your list? <laughs> well, you know, like Plecoptera, it's uh, like a genus or a, a fucking order of uh, inverts that live in. <laughs> this is a weird story. That live in streams. <laughs> the point is, story time. if you take boys and you get them drunk enough, they start doing Plecoptera push up battles, and it's a little weird after that. But don't go to college. Stay not in college, everybody. School's bad for you. Keep going. Sorry. Interrupt. <laughs> I don't even know where we went, but I'm really happy with that tangent. <laughs> oh, no. Like, plecopteras do, like, the anol push-up yeah. to to get air to go over their gills because they, they run it through their abdomen. So if you get human men that are into stream ecology uh, drunk enough, they'll start doing it, is what I'm saying. Only stream ecologist men, though. It's a very specific claim, <laughs> I yeah. feel like we need to do a field test on this. Yeah. Where no. can we go My and meet testing. up <laughs> and like find out how this works? What you need is the like sexy stream ecologist calendar to bait them in. Because there's it's actually much sexier to be a stream ecologist than to be a herpetologist because they have like waiters that have like strips. Do you have a here. waiters fetish? Maybe. I don't know. I was in waiters a lot. A lot. Like an insane amount. And then you're like in a swamp it's, uh, and everything's sweaty, your hair's down, you have like a net <laughs> and I you're electroshocking. So you have like a so you're missing so much. Isn't this like the whole new experience? This is amazing. Right, I might have to and... this out too, but you never know. Oh man. I'm just telling <laughs> you. Now I know. It is the best. <laughs> the kinkiest um... people are always paleontologists and stream ecologists. What do you think? Let's debate. Well, I didn't now, go to college. I'm just doing yeah. college now. <laughs> I missed out on that. Now Who's I'm just most... thinking about like OnlyFans account to start up, like because that's how you make money in OnlyFans. So you have to have like a very specific targeted mm -hmm. audience. So now I'm like, all right, I'm gonna get me some waiters. <laughs> <laughs> gonna go like to some swamp and be like, oh, look at this moss. Listen, how look hot it would be. Like, hey, I'm gonna do a riff account <laughs> and then count pebbles and get your flow meter out. Wink. You're missing. You're missing a niche audience that you could I really know. be selling right now, Jessica. Especially if there was you like fly definitely... fishing imagery, like you were like casting the rod. <sighs> Look at this riparian <laughs> zone. <sighs> I have a I tangent know. to go off of that. All right, keep going. My partner got into um, was it Pinterest? It was that like picture kind of thing online, mm -hmm. and we don't know what he searched, but at some point mm, the it decided. Got him. He was really into mostly naked women fishing. He knows what he searched. And so, <laughs> he knows what he searched. And so, like, it would always come up, and he would just be like, I'm really worried about where that fish hook is, and it just doesn't seem safe. Oh, my God. And Have you like, seen carp's how lips? Does this exist? So, let's be honest. Carps, mm. their lips, you know what I mean? They're real right. luscious. Yeah, they are, they are pretty Big, luscious. Big, gaping mouths. They're bass, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just. Well, bass, I, like, Centrarchidae has all those, like, ridges and stuff. Carps are real sloppy. I mean, mm. I'm just saying. I don't I know what I'm saying, actually. Pop. This has devolved wildly. <laughs> 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 Welcome to the real side of the podcast. <laughs> yeah. No, I we just can't remember. We make money selling snakes, but we'll make money on OnlyFans. <laughs> That's right. Check <laughs> us out in our waiter. <laughs> Sexy waiter time. Yeah, I mean... Lots of people use and enjoy waders, including fishermen. But I think, like, if you're going to make a sexy calendar, like, just the fishing paraphernalia with titties. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yep. What, what were we talking about before this? I can't even remember. Okay, Milk let's snake? talk about Costa Rica. Did you cry when you saw a boa for the first time in the wild because it was an emotionally um, so, changing experience? Here, <laughs> uh, uh -oh. I was crying out of fear. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> so I am... Yeah, I, I am terrified of heights, um, and we've been to Costa Rica three times now. Um, the last time we went, we went to the Arenal Volcano region again, which we'd been to before. And there's this place there called Mystico Hanging Bridges um, that are like suspension, like cable bridges that go through the rainforest. Super cool. Like, it is such an amazing way to see it. But again, me being terrified of heights, some of these bridges are like really high. Uh, and like, cause it's like a mountainous area. So like, it just makes it feel a little bit high and cause there's suspension bridges that you bounce when you walk on them. Totally safe, but 
me. No, it was like way up in the canopy, man. <laughs> yeah, like it's like it's hard. Uh, so like no, most of the time when I'm walking across, like some people just walk across. Like I am holding like both sides of the bridge as I go. And the one place where we saw a boa, you could only see it from one of those oh, bridges, no. and it was like the second tallest bridge there. <laughs> and so I'm there with like my camera and my like yelling at my partner to stand behind me I'm like you need to like hold me as still as you can just because i had this ridiculously long camera lens and i'm trying to get a picture of the fraction of a boa that i can see so like that was terrifying but it was really cool okay. uh because like finding boas in the wild is hard mm -hmm. um especially in costa rica like their preference is to be way up in the trees which is really hard to see mm -hmm. um I will say, like, from what we could see of this one, it was big. Like, I would guess it was around six feet. And all the tour guides I talked to, like, yeah, they're usually, like, between six and ten feet. Which that I just found interesting. Because I feel like when we get Costa Rican boas imported into the U.S. Or people who say that they breed Costa Ricans, they get labeled as dwarf boas. Mm -hmm. And, like, smaller. And they're like, oh, yeah, they're only four to five feet. Oh, the one that I saw was, like, the sort of island forms and, like, their sort of similar coastal forms and then like the main the inland ones are the ones that are big what do you think yeah that's kind of i feel like that could be possible like i feel like some of the locality specific bows that we breed to like folks have specifically bred the smaller ones mm -hmm. so like i think we've maybe like changed some of the phenotype and like size of that in captivity but yeah, it was really cool. Like, every time I go there, like, I tell the guides, they're like, oh, like, do you want to see, like, birds or monkeys? I'm like, I want to see the reptiles. <laughs> and some of them are terrified of snakes. I'm like, man, you live in a weird place to be terrified <laughs> of snakes. They're like, yeah, 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 I know, but I'll still find them for you. But <laughs> I found, like, job. <laughs> yeah, I found a couple, though, that are like, oh, I'm super into reptiles. And, like, they're the ones who will, like, take me off the trail. They're like, this is, like, you know, the emergency fire trail, but... Like, we saw, like, this type of viper up there yesterday. Most of what I see when I go down there are the eyelash vipers, which are always fun to see, but I've seen them, like, 50 times at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I'm like, I just want to see that boa, man. Yeah, but when I was, like, last collection time, like, that was, like, my number one ambition was to go, if I could and not get shot, to Colombia and see, like, a pure Colombian in Branquilla or something, somewhere yeah. in that region where they're very nice and then just like fall on the floor and like weep in the in the <laughs> fucking forest because <laughs> it would have what been like that, that website that has like geographical locations are there any in colombia that have pictures yeah iNaturalist is, is has a lot not as many in colombia because drugs are bad but there are some pictures from colombia they're very beautiful but like i don't i don't know if i've like correctly conveyed those are like most of my personality inside or were when I was a child person. Yeah, they young, were like your best friends. Young women. So it would, I've written back to fan fiction. Boa character <laughs> fan fiction. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. Weird. It's actually like a fantasy novel. A white boa before fire boas even existed is like, you know, destined to fight a, like an elipid king in Japan because a Japanese collector was going to eat her because she was white. You know how they do that? And it was a whole thing. Never finished it. And now I'm old and decrepit. And up. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> but I would say, like, if I saw a boat in a while, I would pee myself 100%, even now. Because it's so... It still it feels special. So I'm glad you didn't die on that bridge. I would die on a bridge. I'm so scared of, like, edges. Yeah. Like, let's it's... fill in the Grand Canyon right away. We don't need that. <laughs> it's a whole edge there. You could fall right yeah. in at any time. <laughs> Did, was it expensive i'm curious of prices you want to share that or because i would like to go down and not be murder raped or whatever to somewhere fun yeah. with boas but it, but still have fun stuff to do yeah like i can't recommend costa rica enough you can definitely go there like on the cheap your money also just goes so much further there and honestly even like the cheaper places down there are still nicer than most of the places in the US just because you're surrounded by a rainforest right. so it's kind of hard not for everything to be gorgeous was it like an eco resort like labeled that way where it was the last time we went it was uh cuz we splurged on our trip um i think altogether 
with flights and the hotel and everything, it was like eight grand for us to go for 10 days. And that was for us to stay in like a very nice, like top notch eco resort for five of those days. That if anything like that was built in the US would be like eight grand a night. It's so like your money goes like a crazy way there. But like you, our previous trips totals were more like three or four grand for like a six day trip for two people. And like what you get for that money is just insane. Do you get like, Jardia also? How do you feel about that? Do you get good? <laughs> I'm being a bitch. Like, do you feel do you feel like you can drink the water in the yeah. eco resort? Okay. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's not, it's not like Mexico. It's yeah. <sighs> Costa yeah, Rica I mean, there's has a lot of expats in Costa Rica, but there's I just didn't know if you felt like you could drink the water. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. <laughs> Would you drink the um, slushy stand gone... at the end of the street? What was that? Like the slushy stand with like fresh fruit? Would you drink that? Oh yeah. Okay. All right. That's good. Yeah. I got Mexico, it. Mexico, like, you wouldn't. You would die. Right no, away. Mexico, I wouldn't. No. Like, no, Costa Rica's not like that at all. <laughs> yeah, and they've gone like all in on eco tourism and like all of that. So like tourism is their lifeblood. Yeah, it's like their lifeblood. It's like everything is totally safe. The food is all amazing. The wildlife is super cool. Depending on like which re- like the only thing I would say like depending on what you want to see when you're there, you want to do your research on the different regions because you will see like different things in different areas. Like if you really want to see snakes, you're probably not going to see a lot of snakes in like Monte Verde, mm-hmm. uh, which is the cloud forest because it's cooler. So there's like very specific types of reptiles that live there. They're there. It's just there aren't as many of them. And in general, finding reptiles is like super hard. Yeah, like every every trip we've gone, we've always managed to see some. And we just really looked out last time and saw a ton. Like you preferred the nicer one or you just think any of them are pretty good if somebody was looking into researching it? Any of them are super fun. We've done most of our planning through... um like a tour agency called Costa Rica Expeditions. And they are really good because you can tell them your like general price range. It would be like, this is how much I'm looking to spend. And they'll give you a bunch of options. And they'll also help you figure out travel if you don't want to deal with renting a car and like that whole thing, which we've never rented a car before just because the roads terrify me. And mm-hmm. then depending on how far out you're going, signage. <laughs> you just get a um, bus or you have a, them pick you up. Normally we would do like, more often than not, they were like private shuttles, which was just like a van. Because mm-hmm. it's just not expensive there. It's kind of like a weird place and that it's a major tourist destination, but it never feels crowded. It's like it's even if expensive. you go, Mm-mm. yeah, it's, I, I don't know. It's, All right, it's a we'll just do the whole back rack alumni uh, vacation trip down there next year. Yes, yes, yep, yes. Down to it. Okay. All for it. As long as we don't get You can get on Airbnbs real cheap. Yeah. yeah. I would prefer to see Colombians in the in the wild, but listen, I also don't want to be shot by the cartel. So not getting shot, major bonus. Mm-hmm. Very good. Yeah, you'll have to put the picture you took of the boa in Costa Rica in the harem group, I so we that. can see. Yeah, you if you want to send body. it to me. <laughs> I stood on that bridge for so long being like, please move. And I was like, nope, you're a boa. It moved like two inches and it was like, and I'm done. I'm like, thanks. That was too much work. All right. I just had a meal. I'm going to be here for the next month. <laughs> okay. I think we did it. I think we did it too. Right? Where can they find you if they want to buy a beautiful, damn tested arena boa? Because I think you have some arena of free. your first order arena free boa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everything has been like Tested a billion times. I am on Outworld Reptiles on Instagram and Facebook. And Morph Market. And Morph Market. Thank you for coming on. I don't know why Thank you. you submitted yourselves to this. <laughs> this was fun. She's going to be volunteering in the future. I can, I can already tell. Yeah, yep, I'm into her it. In. <laughs> I got to get more idea for OnlyFans accounts, man. I'm just going to like make a list. That's how I'm yep. going to retire from the tech world mm-hmm. is I'm going to write erotica and I'm going to have an OnlyFans account. That's actually yeah, a really like, good idea because it'd be a lot easier. It's a really like, good idea. What's happening right yeah. now, currently. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to get convince my partner to also do an OnlyFans account because he has like monkey feet and he can pick <gasps> stuff up with his feet. That and I'm like, totally I have no good idea. idea. Yeah. So you could be he's, famous and rich right now. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, you don't have to show your face. You just have to I show know. your feet. And he's like, people won't pay for that. I'm like, you have no idea what people will pay for. No idea. <laughs> it's the depths <laughs> of the debauchery that is happening. <sighs> All right. Thank you for coming on. Thank you both. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.